The unchanging truth of the universal law of cause and effect is that every single action in the universe produces a reaction no matter what. Anything that happens in the universe is part of cause-effect chain and no action occurs without an equal and opposite reaction. This law applies to all aspects of life, from physical events like throwing a ball or planting a tree, to mental processes such as thoughts and emotions. Just like Newton's third law states, for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. Everything that happens in the universe is ultimately caused by an initial action. I guess what I'm trying to say is that the recent three banks that collapsed in just a matter of days, Silvergate, Silicon Valley and Signature, had a root cause that triggered the collapse. In today's video, we will talk about the root cause that caused these banks to crumble and we will primarily focus on Silicon Valley Bank. Before we continue, if you could take a moment to hit the like and subscribe button, this will help out our channel and it will also prevent contagion collapse in the financial system. I promise. Last Thursday, Silicon Valley Bank was left reeling when a tidal wave of investors and depositors tried to withdraw an unprecedented $42 billion in one day. A bank run of its kind unfolded, bringing down the 16th largest bank in the United States. As of December 31st, 2022, Silicon Valley Bank had approximately $210 billion in total assets and about $175 billion in total deposits. As of today, SVB is a bank that went down in history as the second largest bank to collapse in the United States after Washington Mutual Bank in 2008. So what went wrong? That's the million dollar question plaguing our minds today and the answer is not one but a combination of factors that ultimately led to the downfall of Silicon Valley Bank. As I just mentioned, a bank run of its kind unfolded and the reason it was so unique is that this is the first time we've seen a social media induced bank run. Everything happened so fast leaving many wondering how did the panic get so big so quick? Some are speculating that the first domino fell when an email newsletter by Bern Hobart accompanied by a tweet was published on February 23rd. Bern Hobart Hobart is a writer for the Diff newsletter and according to Evan Armstrong, who outlined the chain of events in a Twitter thread, the Diff newsletter is read by many venture capitalists. On February 23rd, before anyone knew what was happening on a mass scale, Bern Hobart published a tweet and a screenshot of a paragraph from the newsletter. The tweet wrote, Also in today's newsletter, Silicon Valley Bank was, based on market value of their assets, technically insolvent last quarter and is now levered 185 to 1. This certainly caught the attention of many and by the time Thursday March 9th came, when everything came to a screeching halt, high-profile VCs like Peter Thiel's Founders Fund had their money out of the Silicon Valley Bank. Also by that time, SVB's stock price bled over 60%. The stock sell-off and depositors pulling their money out of the bank were kicked into a full gear when Silicon Valley Bank suddenly announced on Wednesday, March 8th, that it sold approximately $21 billion securities portfolio at a loss of nearly $2 billion. SVB also said it was seeking to raise $2.25 billion in share sales. This was the moment when Titanic and hit the iceberg. This attempted stock sale spooked anyone who had any affiliation with the bank. It didn't take long until investors and depositors started running for cover by withdrawing $42 billion in deposits in a single day, which was the last nail in the coffin for SVB. On Friday, March 10, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corp, FDIC, seized control of the bank through a new entity it created called Deposit Insurance National Banks of Santa Clara. All the bank's deposits were transferred to a new bank. Those with insured deposits were promised to have access to their funds by Monday morning, while those with funds exceeding insurance caps were promised receivership certificates for their uninsured balances, meaning businesses with big deposits stuck at the bank were unlikely to get their money anytime soon. That became an enormous issue. FDIC insures deposits only up to $250,000 per account, and many businesses had more funds stuck in the bank than FDIC was able to cover. In fact, only 2.7% of deposits in SVB were insured, while the rest 93% were not going to see the light of day anytime soon. As a result, the economic damage to the businesses that had their money tied to a dead bank were piling to be massive. Many were not in a position to even make payroll. The issue quickly escalated beyond the depositors of SVB and suddenly fear of a full-scale banking collapse was on the rise. On Friday, banking stocks were getting crushed. Shares of First Republic fell nearly 15%, while PacWest Bank Corp dropped more than 35%. Many urged the Treasury Department and the Federal Reserve to step in immediately and guarantee the deposits of those who were not insured by the FDIC. Suddenly, for a brief moment, a tidal wave which was last seen in 2008 was on the horizon. It got so bad that many speculated the US could be heading for a repeat of the Great Depression. The pressure on the Fed and the Treasury Department was immense, and regulators understood that whatever action they were going to take had to be big enough, fast enough before the markets opened on Monday morning. It was fascinating to watch because even those, primarily VCs, who were anti-bailout suddenly demanded government interference. In a matter of minutes, the public divided itself into two camps. Those demanding the government ensure all deposits of SVB and those who insisted 
that the taxpayer would not pay for another bailout. In a remarkable turn of events, the Fed and the Treasury Department came up with a rescue plan that appeared to please both camps. On Sunday night, regulators announced that depositors would have access to all their funds on Monday morning. At the time when this statement was made, the Signature Bank was seized as well as it was on its way to a similar collapse as SVB. Regulators reassured depositors of Signature Bank that they too would have full access to their funds by Monday morning. On Sunday night, the Treasury Department stated that this bailout would not be funded by taxpayers' dollars, but rather by the Deposit Insurance Fund, which is part of the FDIC and funded by quarterly fees that FDIC insured banks pay. The fund is reported to have over $100 billion in it, which is fully sufficient to cover all depositors for Silicon Valley Bank and Signature. Sure, they're saying that the taxpayer will not foot the bill, but if the depositors will be made whole through the Deposit Insurance Fund, that is funded by bank fees, wouldn't banks raise their fees in the future to make up for the expense? So instead of the taxpayer paying for the bailout, it appears it will be shifted to the bank members, which is essentially the same thing. In addition, the Federal Reserve also announced that it's creating a new bank term funding program. The program is designed to ensure that banks can meet the needs of all their depositors and preventing a farther run on banks. This program will allow banks to take a loan from the Fed for up to a year by pledging treasuries, mortgage-backed bonds, and other debt securities as a collateral. The downside side of this program is that banks can borrow funds equal to their par value of the collateral they pledge. This means that the Fed won't look at the market value of the collateral, which in many cases reflect major unrealized losses due to jump in interest rates. This is a win-win situation for banks because they now can borrow more than the market value for their collateral and still get access to funds from the Fed. The FDIC recently released that banks were sending on some $620 billion in unrealized losses and securities at the end of last year. A perk for Federal Reserve on the other hand, if banks can repay all the loans in a year's time, the Treasury Department is providing $25 billion of a credit protection to the Fed just in case. Clearly, the government is going all out to quell the worries of investors and depositors, not just of SVB and Signature, but the entire financial system and prevent larger crises. The question remains the same, how did we get here in the first place? If you remember at the beginning of the video, I mentioned Newton's third law, which states for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. The first domino wasn't the email newsletter or tweet by Bern Hobart but rather years of ultra-loose monetary policy that gave birth to an enormous financial bubble. The crash of Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank were just a reaction to the actions of our central bankers. What happened to Silicon Valley can happen to any bank at any given moment, which is exactly why when SVB went down, the government came in with bazookas to prevent any farther fear of contagion. In a recent article titled Silicon Valley Bank followed exactly what regulation recommended, Daniel Lacall lays out very interesting perspective. The Silicon Valley Bank's mistake during the era of zero interest rates was that it took full advantage of lax monetary policy and regulations. As the saying goes, don't fight the Fed, and that's exactly what they did. The bank's total deposits in 2021 exploded to about $124 billion from $62 billion as the tech sector was booming. That 100% surge in deposits far outpaced a 24% increase at JP Morgan Chase and a 36.5% jump at First Republic Bank. New tech companies were IPOing every single week and everyone wanted a piece. The bank's assets rose in value more than 40% of the assets were long-dated treasuries and mortgage-backed securities, while the rest were new tech and venture capital investments. Daniel Lacall also points out that SVB followed the mainstream rulebook, low-risk assets to balance the risk of venture capital investments. Tech valuations soared in the period of loose monetary policy, and the best way to hedge that risk was with treasuries and mortgage-backed securities. The entire asset base of SVB was one single bet, low rates and quantitative easing for longer. What could possibly go wrong? After all, everyone was told that even Inflation was transitory, but inflation persisted and rate hikes happened. By the end of 2022, SVB had marked to market losses in excess of $15 billion for securities held to maturity, almost equivalent to its entire equity base of $16.2 billion. What happened to SVB is not a lack of regulations, but consequences of ultra-loose monetary policies gone too far. That's all I have for you today, folks. And as always, if you watched to the end, thank you for your time. Stay safe and stay informed.